uh, this evening is so meaningful to me, and hopefully why. Um, when Ernesto Mujica was asking for, and he mentioned uh, two different things that he told that he said were particularly requested. The first was to be, it was to be something that had not been published previously. That one was easy. It, it's not been published. The second was that the focus be clinical. Uh, with regard to that, he suggested, for example, that um, I might speak to how the analyst understands and responds to experiences of not me when forced uh, with identity to deal with identity challenging aspects of the patient. Um, but he also generously added, but it's entirely open to your interest and exploration. It's always a bit risky to say that to me. Um, in a manner of speaking, I uh, honored this request also, but I took advantage of his gift of freedom in order to explore something that's indeed clinical, but perhaps not in the anticipated way. For a long time, I was sure I had finished talking and writing about Harry Stack Sullivan as a separate topic. I thought there was nothing I considered of any great importance remaining in my mind that I hadn't already written about. I was only half right. There's always been something in my mind, but I never wrote about it. And I never really wanted to because I wasn't sure I knew how to present it in the way I felt it. It came as a surprise to me because it's something I always felt should be said, but that I myself didn't feel I had the right words to make it transparently clear that I see the phrase uh, more human than otherwise as an opportunity for an overdue tribute to Sullivan, but not only Sullivan, the genius whose breathtaking conceptualization of what it means to be human revolutionized psychoanalytic thinking. I believe it's time to equally honor another aspect of Sullivan. Sullivan, the human being, and allow the man himself to be recognized as more human than otherwise. In my view, his aphorism has subtly neglected the author of it as a member of the world of others to whom this statement is more easy to apply because they're either patients or people more readily seen as being in need of this reassurance. So as you soon see, I'll be looking at the phrase as applying both to Harry, the elusive but very human human being, as well as Dr. Sullivan, who presented himself as if he didn't need to be seen that way. I'm, I'm not sure even now that I found the right words, but I'm hoping that maybe I have what makes me hopeful is that while I was writing, I could feel my love for both parts of Sullivan telling me to take a chance. Even though I never knew Sullivan personally because he had died before I began my training at White, I felt that I knew him, quirkiness and all, both through his writing and through the stories of what he was like, some of which were told as in-house confessions by people who had been supervised by him. This is why in the early 1980s I wrote so many papers about his ideas. My way of helping him go further than he did, but also my then covert way of trying to make him easier to understand because we all knew that Sullivan was not an easy read. But it was Steve Mitchell who, though he may not have been the first White Institute author, 
that published the fact that Sullivan was difficult to read, was the first to not only underline it, but to contextualize it as something worth further thinking. At this point, before I continue, I want to express my appreciation to my old friends Karen Marasek and Ernesto Mujica, and to Jill Bellinson and the other members of her colloquium committee, Bill Lubart and Karen Gennaro, for giving me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts about why I'm just wild about Harry <laughs> and continue being equally wild about Dr. Sullivan. It's, it's my belief, and pretty much always has been, that Sullivan was a creative genius equal to Freud. But he was more than that. Steve Mitchell, in his chapter on interpersonal psychoanalysis in Greenberg and Mitchell, commented that Sullivan, I quote, has been one of the most influential, most ambitiously radical, and most frequently misread figures in the history of psychoanalytic ideas. End quote. It's been suggested, Mitchell states, quote, Sullivan secretly dominates much of modern clinical psychiatry in the United States. End quote. And has even been described by Bob Michaels as America's most important and unique contributor to dynamic psychiatry. But there's a paradox, says Mitchell, and I quote, Sullivan's concerns and formulations derided by classical authors during his lifetime or ignored, have resurfaced within the most important and popular Freudian authors of the past decade, yet he's rarely credited with originating these approaches and ideas. These paradoxes derive from the political consequences of Sullivan's radical break with Freudian orthodoxy, as well as from the demands posed by the substance and style of his approach. This is still a quote from, from Mitchell. Sullivan demands more of his readers than most analytic authors. He never systematized his concepts into anything approaching a formal unity. This failure seems to have been a product both of Sullivan's great wariness concerning the misuse of theory as dogma and overcautiousness a deep fear of being misunderstood. It's Mitchell's last phrase, a deep fear of being misunderstood, to which this talk is in various ways addressed. I'm going to offer what I believe is an overdue tribute to Sullivan as a human being that goes a long way in explaining why, as Mitchell put it, Reading Sullivan is an acquired taste that requires that extremely active and critical engagement with the flow of his ideas, end quote. The idea of human development as intrinsically interpersonal changed everything about psychoanalysis. The main reason I came to the White Institute to become an analyst was to learn what Sullivan had to say from reading him and studying with those who had been mentored by him. And learn it I did. But as Mitchell wrote, it wasn't easy. His concepts were his own. But among other difficulties, why the devil did he have to invent a language that had to be his own? The answer, because he was an operationalist, is sort of what candidates were told. And it's, of course, partly accurate. Sullivan indeed uses operational concepts, but what I want to discuss tonight includes the other part also, the part that Mitchell terms his deep fear of being misunderstood, a fear that had a variety of consequences among which was his developing a language that was so uniquely his own that while it protected him from being misunderstood, it also kept him from being easily understood, unless you had a strong reason to want to understand him. But as you'll see, 
and isn't his idiosyncratic language that I want to focus on, but rather what I believe has made him misunderstood as a human being, as well as insufficiently acknowledged by other psychoanalytic schools of thought as the genius he indeed was. The thing that I'm going to be talking about, which perhaps may not even feel like such a big deal at this point in time, is my view that Sullivan was an untreated trauma survivor, and that his dissociated dread of shared emotional connection inordinately compromised what his public, published work revealed about what actually took place at a personal level between himself and a patient, the two human beings in his consultation room, and that this in turn compromised what he was able to communicate about why the therapeutic relationship itself, not just the patient, is more human than otherwise. Could such a thing be said about other major theorists? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't doubt it for a second. In fact, many people have been writing a version of this about Freud for a long time. Sullivan, I will argue, was a trauma survivor. And in my view, the trauma goes far back in his childhood. I'm not going to try to support this by speculating on the nature of his trauma, nor how far back in his childhood it goes. I, I couldn't, even if I wanted to. My belief is based on my years of experience as a clinician, not on direct biographical data. There are quite a few biographies of him that deal with the loneliness of his childhood. None of them provide what you'd call hard evidence of it being traumatic, but they're worth reading anyway. If you're interested, check out the reference section in Mark Blesner's 2005 article, The Gay Harry Stack Sullivan, Posting Contemporary Psychoanalysis. Everyone to whom I've ever spoken who knew him wondered if he was disturbed in some way, such as schizophrenic. But as with many iconic figures, there's knowing and there's knowing. I hope to put the myth of his schizophrenia in a different light. That said, um, I guess I should begin with the old joke about psycho psychoanalysts who present papers. Here's the conclusion upon which I base my facts. <laughs> Sullivan's personality was organized by serious dissociative processes that though to a degree shielded him personally from the unregulated impact of spontaneous human relatedness, simultaneously made his writing brilliant as it was, frustrating to read as a coherent body of thought. From this standpoint, I think it's not unreasonable to suggest that interpersonal psychoanalysis might have achieved earlier and fuller recognition in spite of its dismissal by the classical school had Sullivan's written contribution been less difficult to cope with. To those who might be tempted to listen to my talk as though it's about current psychoanalytic politics, perhaps the politics of interpersonal versus relational, I hope you don't. It's about the commonality among people within which the uniqueness, even the conflicts among schools of thought is just a part. The most <coughs> imperfectly kept in-house secret at White during the years I was a candidate, and for quite some time afterward, was that no one who took the first year required course on beginning the treatment, a course based on Sullivan's book, The Psychiatric Interview, could catch on to what Sullivan was getting at. <laughs> that, books, that book, like all of his books, was put together posthumously from a series of his lectures, and it was not really about, a be about beginning a treatment, 
but was a picture of what Sullivan saw himself doing as a therapist that was to be taken as a model for how an interpersonal psychiatrist works. His key concept was what he called the detail of inquiry, and it is arguably the concept that initiated the sea change in psychoanalytic theory and practice. So what was the problem? It was that no teacher could answer the question that were always asked by candidates. The main ones being, after you do a detailed inquiry, then what happens? When does the actual psychoanalysis start? In other words, the candidates wanted to know when and how the detailed inquiry transitions into psychoanalysis. The problem wasn't simply that the course was labeled beginning the treatment. The problem was that Sullivan seemed to believe that he already had made the answer clear, even though he declined to use the term psychoanalysis. The implied answer given to those who insisted on one was that the detailed inquiry is the source of therapeutic action and that the clinical process he called detailed inquiry never ends. In other words, the candidates were sort of being told that they were asking the wrong question and that eventually they'd understand what Sullivan was saying, sort of like when you grow up you understand everything. The irony, of course, was that it was the wrong question, but wrong because it wasn't the right question. The right question was the one to ask after the first one was blown off. Why is the detailed inquiry enough? What is it that, from Sullivan's perspective, takes place interpersonally between the therapist and patient that makes self-growth possible? Sure, it's easy to see that each instance of a detailed inquiry increases a patient's cognitive understanding of the fact that in some particular situation with some particular other, he has obscured an aspect of what was taking place because it makes him anxious. But there was no mention of the therapist himself ever being such an other. To an uninitiated reader of Sullivan, which analytic candidates mostly were, his writing didn't at face value seem to be demonstrating anything other than the therapist as a catalyst for increasing cognitive awareness. And the Freudians had a field day by using this as a focal point of an attack that they claimed, they claimed he did not believe in an unconscious. They were dead more. But this is why the question that was asked by candidates, when does the psychoanalysis start, should have been an opener for the larger but unasked question doesn't the detailed inquiry, the way Sullivan presents himself, seem a bit one-sided? If the work doesn't seem to involve the therapist interpersonally as a player, then what was Sullivan and his patient doing together that allowed his patient's unconscious self-experience, not simply his behavior, to become reorganized? Sullivan, in fact, did not believe that cognitive understanding is what it's all about. For me, it was always evident that something more than that was going on. But Sullivan did not make it evident what that something more was. Candidates were told that Sullivan considered his viewpoint an approach rather than technique which appealed to me immediately, which to some extent made it argumentative for a candidate to look for a further rationale as to why there seemed to be no effort to work with transference and counter-transference. Sullivan provided just enough of a reason to make operationalism itself seem sufficient. In effect, says Sullivan, the inquiry increases 
No, the inquiry creates anxiety in the patient because it threatens his self-esteem. If the therapist allows enough anxiety to enable unrevealed details to emerge, but not so much anxiety that it prevents their emergence, then the therapist is doing his job. In other words, Sullivan operationally addresses why the inquiry process isn't simply information gathering that is designed to create a more cognitively complete story about what takes place between the patient and other people, other, that is, than the therapist. Some candidates accepted this explanation more than others. Many liked it. Others remained unsatisfied. There were candidates who simply didn't like Sullivan's writing because it was quirky as well as difficult. I loved it. I was one of those candidates who simply knew that Sullivan's clinical illustrations were dealing with unconscious processes, even though I couldn't figure out the reason why what he did worked. I continue to believe that Sullivan, the clinician, was indeed helping his patients in a brilliant and innovatively new way. But Sullivan, as an author who was trying to help readers discover what made him the kind of clinician he truly was, confused most of his readers, especially those who tried to relate it to other schools of thought. His writing left out the fact that what he experienced taking place in his mind while with his patient was what organized his so-called operational choices of what to do and what, and what questions to ask. It made his writing appear that he believed that one could dispense with the therapist's personal experience during the treatment as part of describing what took place interpersonally between the patient and other people in his external life. There were more than a few people at White, however, including me, who could feel him, who didn't believe he was simply an operationalist. And we could feel him working experientially, even though he would never have called it interpersonal. So in my title for tonight's course, I don't know if you remember what the title is. <laughs> it's Sullivan as, as pragmatic visionary, operationalist, and opera relationalist. In, in the title, I tried to capture this anomaly in Sullivan by calling him a pragmatic visionary. My old friend, Leston Havens, describes Sullivan's stay out of the process technique as counterprojective, which I think is accurate descriptively but makes it seem as though Sullivan was basically doing it strategically. At one level, Havens is right. Sullivan worked with many patients then diagnosed as schizophrenic, who would now be, many of them would be seen as suffering from dissociative disorders. And he was very attuned to their potential vulnerability in encountering the traumatically destabilizing impact of unanticipated otherness in the here and now. But I'm offering the view that it's more multifaceted than that. The image that comes to mind, if you'll allow me uh, a Jungian side trip into the ancient world, is closer to the Greek myth of the centaur Chiron the wounded healer, who was born of God, but because he couldn't heal his own wound, gave up his immortality. And that Harry, sent by the gods as an embodiment of Chiron, could not deliver the second half of his healing message. To put it into more up-to-date language, because of the unprocessed affective residue of trauma in his own life, Dr. Sullivan couldn't risk exposing Harry to the interpersonal field that he shared with others, including his patients. And so the other half 
of the message he was meant to deliver could not be passed on to his students or colleagues, even though he used it with his patients as much as he was able, providing he didn't compromise the safety of Harry that fueled his mistrust of others. Now, in my view, he in fact bolstered this safety by his over-dedication to extreme operationalism. A particularly transparent example of this, one that made most folks at the White Institute very uncomfortable, and not always silently, was that he defined what existed inside as unshareable because it was the place of the illness, for which he invented the term parataxis. Only when it became cognitively observable, consensually, was it experientially healthy enough to be shareable. I'm not certain when and where he said it was the place of the illness. I can't find it. But it was something that I heard stated over and over again at the Institute during my training. It was another in-house sort of secret that, that personalized what Havens called his counter-projective clinical stance of deflecting the attention away from his, himself and not to some outside other. <clears throat> okay, I'm now going to offer the hypothesis that the presence of the elusive Harry also accounts in no small measure for the puzzling but well-known difference in tone between his two most notable contributions, at least what I consider his most notable the interpersonal theory of psychiatry and the psychiatric interview. Notwithstanding the fact that Sullivan's lectures were compiled into books only after his death, the point still stands. Among the several books that resulted from his lectures, I believe that the two I mentioned are his greatest contribution. And that the, the disparity between the two is not due to poor editing in choosing the lectures for each book. Now, I would submit that the reason is largely found in the man himself. The dissociative gap between the self-states of Dr. Sullivan, the courageously brilliant thinker, and Harry, the wounded healer. In the interpersonal theory of psychiatry, he advances a viewpoint that is a tour de force both persuasive and complex, not just about psychiatry, but about what it means to be human. In this book, Sullivan's personal humanity is so breathtaking that it makes the reading not just easy, at least it was for me, but pleasurable. His freedom to reveal what went into his thinking subjectively to the reader his willingness to share his thought processes that led him to arrive at his formulations created not only incredible clarity about his ideas, but enabled many readers to feel personally the connection between his ideas and their relevance to the experience of one's own humanity. However, in the psychiatric interview, the book in which an image of Sullivan as clinician, the book that should reflect the humanity of his ideas as they are manifested in the relationship between himself and his patient, one would expect to see him at his most human. Instead, the absence of anything that he experiences going on in his mind while he's with his patient is overwhelming. Where is the Harry Stack Sullivan whom you would expect to be exemplifying the precepts he clearly embraces in the interpersonal theory of psychiatry. Before I try to sort of answer this, I ask you to listen to something written by Carruth in his introduction to the English translation of Sartre's Nausea. I quote, <clears throat> that he had to create his own system of thought in order to avoid being enslaved by those of others. 
And Sartre has said that genius is what man invents when he's looking for a way out. <laughs> Lest anybody make a mistake about what I'm saying. My point is not that Sullivan's genius, his unparalleled contribution that changed the face of psychoanalytic thinking, was because he was a trauma survivor. But rather, because he was a trauma survivor, reading his monumental contribution has for too long been limited to being what Mitchell calls an acquired taste that requires an extremely active and critical engagement with this flow of ideas. And equally important, that Sullivan the man is rarely credited with originating these approaches and ideas. In uh, a 1995 article, 33 years after I published three early papers, in which I implied that Sullivan was a messenger with half the message, I finally made explicit that I'm quoting myself here. Sullivan's theory of interpersonal analysis reduced to its essentials is, in my view, a theory of the dissociative organization of personality in response to trauma. End quote. But I, too, was delivering only half of my own message. So here I am tonight, 20 years after I wrote that paper, saying it again. But this time, I'm not just saying that Sullivan knew a lot about trauma. I'm saying that he knew it, and he knew it personally, too personally. So personally, that unless this is taken openly into account, it's going to continue to have a dissociative impact on his contribution that remains enacted long after it no longer impacts the man himself. Or so I would argue. So the other half of my message is this. <clears throat> For 60 years, readers of Sullivan have had an unsolved problem. A problem which I am not trying to do away with when I call him an upper operationalist and an upper relationalist. I, I invented the term upper relationalist in my own language because it's a way of my confronting what Sullivan could not resolve in himself. Sullivan was most certainly a genius, and Sullivan was indeed a humanist. But Sartre's epigram is convincing. Genius is what man invents when he's looking for a way out. And Sullivan the genius needed and found a way out of what was personally too much for Harry. So, no matter how important Sullivan's thinking is justly held to be, the problem for the reader of his work has never been resolved. The interpersonal theory he created that challenged Freud collides with the reader's own affective experience of Sullivan as a clinician. <clears throat> Okay, now I want to say a few words about a subject that, as most of you know, is of special interest to me. Sullivan's relationship with the phenomenon of dissociation, as it appears in his books. His writing is deservedly acknowledged for having included, some say introduced, the concept of dissociation to psychoanalysis. But he never showed how or if he himself worked with it clinically. Ironically, my frustration as a reader is itself almost an enactment of this entire issue. Because I was always sensing what was between the lines more than I realized. The irony is that my argument in this paper is so did Sullivan. But I couldn't have said so at the time. But I did begin to recognize that, at least for me, reading Sullivan's books was not sufficient. As textbooks, they forced me to recognize what Bion called the presence of an absence. 
And the absence was experientially the same absence I felt when I was trying to connect experientially to Sullivan, the person who was sitting in his office with his patient. I couldn't find the man who was the therapist. And yet I could feel that the man was somehow there with his patients in a very personal way. I finally gave up trying to figure it out on my own. It, uh, it, it, it was then I, I turned to traumatologists and, and meetings of traumatologists to learn how they um, work experientially with dissociation and how I can make it fit with my own analytic work. I think it was because of that that my clinical work became increasingly experiential, not as a technique, but as a way of being. In a review of uh, Helen Vendler's book, Invisible Listeners, Langdon Hammer spoke to the relationship between the self-states of a reader and those of a poet. Quote, The tones of voice by which a speaker is created implies a relationship between the speaker and a listener or reader, creating an uncanny intimacy, inviting us into a space outside ordinary time. Often, this means overhearing the poet talking not so much to himself as to someone who is not there. Poetry of this kind begins in the poet's craving for a listener, a desire so keen it calls the object into being. Now, consider for a second the vocabulary that uh, Hammer uses. Uncanny intimacy inviting us into a space outside ordinary time. Sullivan, too, used the word uncanny. He used it a lot, but not as an aspect of experience that one might wish for. He used it to describe the incipient horror of traumatic mental disorganization that was on the verge of being out of control. In William Blake's language, Sullivan's intellect refused to be enslaved by the minds of others which allowed his lectures to posthumously generate a series of books that remain the seminal alternative to a view of the encapsulated mind. But Sullivan, the theorist, who was challenging the theory that came out of Freud's mind, was always accompanied by another part of himself that was fighting off the entrapping potential of that other mind itself. <coughs> a mind to which he had submitted himself earlier in his career. Dr. Sullivan's soaring intellect did not free Harry, the trauma survivor, from his day-to-day -day experiential dread of being trapped in the mind of the other, whether other theorists, friends, colleagues, or patients. As with every trauma survivor, affect that cannot be regulated has to be controlled and part of his ability to control was through dissociating from the here and now and deflecting it. Once you can see the role of both elements, Sullivan's recognition that we are all simply more human than otherwise makes him more human than he's ever been. I do not believe that Sullivan was remote as a clinician. What I do believe is that he was very engaged with the patient's subjectivity, but he could not allow his own and his patients to exist simultaneously. That is, even though he could not open himself to what Alan Shore calls state sharing, what I now recognize as I had been reading between the lines in the psychiatric interview was his unacknowledged, very real capacity to connect with the patient's affective inner world. And I could feel it was this that led him to know what to ask in the detailed inquiry. It was this that let him know when the patient was starting to feel too anxious. I can't tell you how often I heard someone talk about Sullivan always having a finger on the patient's pulse.
questions he asked didn't come from intellectually figuring out what was missing in the patient's story. He could feel personally what was missing as an enacted communication. But he never wrote about that aspect of it because he insulated himself affectively from shared personal experience as much as possible, he was unable to think about, much less deliver, what I'm calling the second half of his message, that the individual internal worlds of two human beings can be observably experienced by the other person and hold the potential to become an open part of what he calls consensually observable. Sullivan was committed to rectifying the focus on what Freud held were fantasies generated by a self-contained mind. It was not that he repudiated the existence of unconscious experience. His writing on selective attention, especially on dissociation, demonstrate the contrary. His difficulty as an interpersonal theoretician was that he believed the term unconscious meant something that could only be inferred to exist because it exists inside the mind of one person. For Dr. Sullivan, this meant it was inaccessible to direct observation by two people. For Harry, it wasn't a matter of correcting Freud's theory. It was personal. And it was something scary. To Dr. Sullivan, it became the battleground on which his theory of interpersonal psychiatry was for. If what was unconscious was only inferred, you couldn't see it, and it thereby had no observable reference that was available to another person. In other words, it wasn't real enough. But the Harry, the trauma survivor, what you can't see is what's going to come at you from around the next corner as soon as you relax your vigilance. For Harry, it was too real. Okay, all well and good. I put it that Dr. Sullivan was protecting Harry. Nothing wrong with that. The result, however, was that Dr. Sullivan ended up constructing a conceptual position about the inside-outside distinction that wasn't just operational, it was wrong. And he didn't quite know that. What is inside is not unobservable, it is observable experientially through dissociated affective communication. And not only is it observable, but its observability is the half of Sullivan's message that wasn't delivered. That each person's dissociated affect is observable to the other, even though initially neither person knows cognitively that a communication process is taking place. So what about the term relation? Aha! Little by little, a loose confederation of different analytic schools of thought has developed that calls itself relational. I refer to my own identity as interpersonal relational. Interpersonal slash relational. In a 2009 paper in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, I even had the chutzpah to state that as far as I was concerned, the term relational actually means interpersonal relation because both parts were always in Sullivan's work, even though the intersubjective part was written about less directly. It took chutzpah because nobody loved me for that. In, 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 in either camp. Intersubjective communication fuels what Sullivan would see as operationally interpersonal. I rarely experience myself as anything like what Sullivan would describe as the analyst's role being that of an expert, because my sense of participant observation feels more like what I call stumbling along and hanging in and accepting my own uncertainty is a large part of the relationship. When enactments are taking place, the analyst is typically going to feel somewhat destabilized affectively because of the shared power of the enactment. It is when the individually dissociated not-me self-states of both analyst and patient 
can communicate cognitively as well as procedurally and affectively that what Sullivan would call a consensually interpersonal context can take shape. It was the writing of Edgar Levinson that first brought this undeveloped aspect of Sullivan's contribution out of the shadows and on the center stage. And in so doing, Levinson ushered psychoanalysis into his next phase. Forty years ago, in The Fallacy of Understanding, yeah, I'm still doing it, he wrote that the therapist, as an extension of Sullivan's participant observer, becomes a total participant and an observer of his own experience of participation. You don't know how radical that was at that time. Now, the analyst's ongoing overarching clinical attention has become dedicated to the nuances of what's taking place within the patient-therapist relationship, thus extending Sullivan's operational criteria and observability to the ever-shifting interface between interpersonal and intersubjective. The foundation was laid for the exploration of a dissociated dyadic context being as observable as that which takes place consciously between, two, between people, but observable in a different manner. It's affectively observable during the procedural connection that exists during enactments. As the enactments are jointly and openly processed between patient and analyst, the inner world of each partner becomes consensually available to the conscious cognition of both. In other words, it took Levinson to process what was enacted by Sullivan. Levinson's concept of being caught up in what was being played out and working your way out of it liberated the second half of the message. Now it's almost taken for granted that the primary source of therapeutic action lies in the fact that it's not only the patients in the world that is effectively destabilized during enactments, but the analysts too. This change in the complexity of our understanding the way that analysts and patients exist in their relationship has added the missing piece to Sullivan's half message, and by so doing, allows Sullivan's own contribution to be seen as visionary in a way that I call upper relation. Some final reflections, including the myth of Sullivan's schizophrenia. In a 2005 article titled The Gay Harry Stack Sullivan, Mark Lesnar wrote about Sullivan's tenure at Shepherd Pratt, where he organized and ran his own therapeutic milieu for gay male patients who were diagnosed as schizophrenic. Though Mark spoke to the role played by dissociation in Sullivan's personality, he understandably presented it almost as a consequence of its specific content, Sullivan's discomfort with his own homosexuality. As he says, just look at the examples of not me dissociation in his books you will see that most of them are caught up with disavowed homosexuality." End quote. I think that Mark is accurate in his central thesis, but I also believe that as with any trauma survivor, Sullivan's use of association was not per se driven by the content. Trauma-related dissociation is generated by the automatic triggering of dissociation by the brain to prevent affect dysregulation from becoming uncontrollable. It does this by assuring dissociative blindness as an evolutionary survival mechanism, a state-dependent blindness that one finds in almost every untreated trauma survivor. It assures the inability to observe another mind observing yours. It further assures blindness to the blindness and thereby an inability to self-reflect about it. So that, that is to say, no matter what the content that is linked to the residue of unprocessed affect from specific interpersonal trauma, 
The basic blindness is to the very fact that dissociation is taking place. It is this, the brain's use of automatic dissociation as a proactive smoke detector, that I suggest most bonded Harry to Dr. Sullivan and Dr. Sullivan to his patients. It is also the reason that during the course of writing this talk, my thinking led me to Sullivan's book, Schizophrenia as a Human Process. A book that Helen Swick Perry stated in her preface, quote, covers all the major articles that Sullivan wrote from the beginning of his writing career, 1924 through 1935. Remember those years. This would mean, of course, that's the end of her quote, this would mean, of course, that it was the period that Sullivan was still, at least formally, on speaking terms with the Freudians, but was personally battling to escape from his experience of feeling trapped within the mind of the man who created the theory. I became especially interested in, in a chapter first published as an article in 1931 titled The Modified Psychoanalytic Treatment of Schizophrenia. It's for the most part based on Sullivan's experience at Shepard Pratt, but what I found most compelling was not his understanding of schizophrenia as a human process because it was an interpersonal one. I already knew about that. What was new to me in this reading many years later was that in describing the essence of how he saw schizophrenia, he was even then lucidly formulating what others are now rediscovering more than 80 years later. That except for a few exceptions, the pathology of what has been termed schizophrenia is driven by the process of dissociation and its power to isolate aspects of the self into parts that are not allowed to coexist. In Sullivan's words, a, quote, a state of serious disorder of the integrating systems. I think there is little doubt and many of Sullivan's patients at Shepherd Track would today be diagnosed as having one form or another of a severe dissociative disorder or a personality disorder in which overly stressed dissociative structure has failed. For example, Andrew Moskowitz and his colleagues have presented compelling research findings that led them to state, quote, loyalist concept of loosening of associations does not refer narrowly to a disorder of thought, and we argue for the recognition of the dissociative roots of this most important psychiatric category. He's talking about schizophrenia. In my most recent reading of Sullivan's 1931 article, I could see the start of Sullivan's developing romance with operationalism, but I could also see that he was at that time still comfortable in writing about interpersonal relationships that operate in the inner world and writing about the dynamics of these states of mind which he called them with the same penetrating clarity as he later wrote about interpersonal relations as they exist out there. But let me show you what I mean. Even back then, Sullivan operationally referred to certain aspects of the personality as tendency systems. But fascinatingly, he wrote about certain tendency systems that he, without hesitation, called states of altered consciousness. These altered states that he later would come to call not me personifications are, he writes, permitted to discharge themselves with no direct manifestation to other tendency systems. That is to say, he's postulating what he calls a dynamic balance between, quote, a tendency system manifesting in the conscious self and the one dissociated from such manifestation. This is not a repudiation of unconsciousness, but an expansion of its meaning. He then writes that what generates the disorder of integration called schizophrenia is a person's inability to control these dissociated states of altered consciousness. In other words, 
it is not that he sees these states as pathological in themselves. What he in fact says is the opposite, that these systems are, quote, invariably represented in the self. That is, the phrase being more human than otherwise was not his way of being kind to people diagnosed as schizophrenic by telling the world that they were human too. In his words, invariably represented in the self, he was proposing that we all have dissociated states of consciousness and that what he calls psychotic is an anomalous event. It cannot occur unless the not-me states become so powerful that they refuse to remain dissociated and force the entire personality into a continuing dynamic balance that cannot be regulated. That's all stated by him. In other words, what Sullivan was addressing is a danger that I suggest he knew firsthand. The unanticipated confrontation with an interpersonal shock that might perpetuate a continuing dysregulation in one state of consciousness. What could otherwise be described as uncontrolled self-state switching? Not a bad way to describe the dread of re-traumatization. He writes, quote, any personality in whom there is a chronic dissociation of a powerful tendency system may show persisting schizophrenia after any event that destroys the balance by strengthening the dissociated tendency system or by enfeebling the dissociating system, end quote. And then, now listen to this, you can, you can practically hear him speaking to Harry as he writes, it's equally clear that retreat from the personal realities of others the seclusiveness and the inaccessibility to easy personal contacts that are so classically schizophrenic are but the avoidance of accentuated conflict between the tendency systems which strive to integrate mutually incongruous interpersonal relations, end quote. I felt like replying, you bet, Harry. It can happen to any personality, and it's a good thing Dr. Sullivan is here to protect you. Sullivan notes, with regard to patients, he turns incipiently schizophrenic. He quote, the extreme distress caused by reason of specific painful experience with all previous significant persons. But why did he also write, quote, as it is ordinarily applied, the psychoanalytic situation involves a patient, the organization of whose self is not satisfactory. As it is ordinarily applied. I doubt he would have you thought the sentence necessary unless he felt that with any, quote, ordinary patient, the danger of reactivating, quote, specific painful experience with all significant persons can easily lead to what he later in the same book calls a transference jam that, as he puts it, will force the doctor to, quote, inquire into his deficiencies. But how do I know? As I said, it was all very fuzzy when I was a candidate. Given my personality, however, you know, I, I retrospectively wondered whether I benefited from the fuzziness because it gave me a stronger reason to inquire into things on my own. And the thing I discovered during my inquiry while preparing to write this paper, the thing that has made me most want to share the discovery is that the founder of interpersonal psychoanalysis, Harry Stack Sullivan, a wounded healer and pragmatic visionary, has made me more grateful than ever to be a member of his family. Thank you.